my first poem is called Winter, and um, it, I also name Poliahu, who is a goddess, and if you didn't know, she is the goddess of snow and cold. Winter. I'm not like Hina, Maui's mother, who worked all day beating kapa into cloth, who asked for more sun to finish her work. No. I'm, not, I'm too selfish to think about others, to think about work, to think about making a world. I'm too busy daydreaming, listening to roaring surf at Bellows Beach, sitting on the warm sand with my father, my husband, my children, my plate of grilled soyu chicken, potato salad, kimchi, missing my mother who loved to swim, her long strokes silent in the salty sea, who walked with me along Honolulu Beach, searching for glass floats, imperfect green balls bobbing like bubbles in the waves, who laughed openly at herself, her mistakes, 13th child of 14, one of the few who died before the others. I'm not like Hina, Maui's mother, but I too wish for someone to capture the sun, to slow it down, to let the filtered light wrap around me, wrap around my daydreams, lighting up an inky sky and keep the goddess Poliahu at bay before she throws snow upon the soothing sand and my dreams freeze and shatter. And this is uh, my second poem and it's called What You Won't Remember. A woman said that when your life comes to an end, it's not your work you're going to remember. The work you chose because your pal convinced you to do it. The work that others said was unskilled women's work. The work that your dad's wife told you was for those who can't. The work that taught you how to observe kids, read body language. The work that helped you understand what kids need to make sense of the world that your hands on them must be light, like running them over a Ouija board, feeling the energy but not interrupting it. The work that unleashed wonder and spread it around like the balls on the pachinko board, the balls that have a path, though almost imperceptible, yet know they're going and unconsciously we work, seek to find their destination. The work that feels like it's moving in a lighted galaxy among meteors, avoidable and unavoidable. The work that led you back to the beginning when all you did was read books, when all you did was write letters and poems, when time slowed down, when you felt each summer day pass, lying under the rainbow shower tree, watching the blossoms rain down on you, when the trade winds shimmied the branches, when all of your work felt like play. Thank you. Misty, um, let, let me first say I'm just really happy to be included in this issue and in this institute. This is great. Can you guys hear me fine? Okay. Um, yeah. So the the piece I have in the issue is um, it's well, it's a short story, but really it was uh, the first chapter of the novel that I finished actually, but at some point kind of lost faith in. Um, but there was something I still liked about it enough that you know, this, this, this section, I think, uh, kind of works. Um, you need to know a little bit. I'll just set you up really quickly. Um, I'm only going to read about five pages, but it, you know, it's from a 300-page thing. Um, this, um, the main character is named Percival. He goes by Val. Um, he was born deaf, and he has cochlear implants fully implanted cochlear implants, which don't actually exist yet. So we're slightly in the future, in the near future. Um, and he's grown up in a really kind of unsupportive environment in New York. Um, he's been bullied at school. His parents have been kind of condescending to him. Um, and so he, at some point he embraced this um, philosophy of, of singularitarianism. Um, for those of you who don't know that the idea of the technological singularity is the idea that fairly soon humans are going to merge with our technology and arrive at something kind of post-human. And Val is kind of looking forward to this because he already sees himself as a, sort of a cyborg 
and it becomes for him a kind of almost religion of, of sort of world renunciation. And he's looking forward to the future. Um, he comes to Hawaii. He actually grew up here. He left at five, but he comes to UH to study futures studies, which strikes him as the only thing worth studying since, since um, you know, the apocalypse is nigh. Um, and actually, he's been somewhat disappointed so far with the program because he's the only person there who seems to take the singularity seriously. Um, and in one of his classes, he has met a girl named Maya and they've bonded over Lord of the Rings and for better or worse, he's fallen in love. And this is a problem for someone who has, thinks he has no interest in a human future. Being in love is a problem. So that's what the, the section I'm, I'm gonna read is about. Okay. Falling in love has been a stroke of incredible luck for Val. His brain is gushing with beautiful drugs. Never mind that his grades have begun to tank and that he hasn't made a lick of progress in theodicy lately. This is a computer program he's been working on. Maya is clearly the best thing that has ever happened to him. Except that maybe she isn't. Maybe she's the worst thing. The fucked up truth is Val's not sure. In embracing his humanity, he worries that he might be betraying his transhumanity. After all, none of this is supposed to happen. None of it fits with any obvious extrapolation from the past. No girl ever desired him before, not in this way. He can't begin to understand what Maya sees in him. She is so cute. She isn't normal in the pejorative sense. She loves horror movies, plays electric bass, has enough scars on her legs to attest to her having grown up skating in a skate park. But she does have a generally positive outlook on the future and singularity accepted, Val can't find any good reason why she shouldn't. Could it be that Harmon is right, that the future, the futures rather, really are open and multiple? Val can actually feel his mind dividing against itself. He's so happy that he's miserable, but also he's so happy that he's miserable. He hides the misery from Maya, but she gets glimpses of it when she finds him brooding after sex, when he visibly flinches as he tells her how he's never felt these feelings before. And when one muggy afternoon, he shakes off her hand on the front steps of Hamilton Library. What the fuck, she says. That's a future studies professor, he says, pointing his chin toward the tall dude with the soul patch who is posting flyers for some protest or other on the bulletin board beneath the monkey pod tree. So? So he already gives me a hard enough time about the singularity without knowing that I'm in a relationship. It wouldn't help my case. Dr. Payne is the youngest and least clueless member of the future studies faculty. Harmon introduced them in the hall one day and they chatted for a few minutes. Payne was cool, at least by comparison with Harmon. Soul patch aside, he also knew a thing or two about the singularity. Granted, he was skeptical of the hard takeoff or foom scenario and wary of AI's conceivable indifference to humanity as it pursued its own evolutionary ends, as if evolution had ends. But he was at least a techno-optimist of sorts. In particular, he advocated for archaeological cities on the ocean and the exponential growth of spirulina in algae to keep pace with population growth. Val has told Maya all about the singularity, and she has listened non-judgmentally. She takes a different stance toward it, however. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen, she says. Just be yourself and don't worry about it. There is wisdom in that, to be sure. But Val, for one, doesn't want to be blindsided. Their relationship is still young enough that they don't talk about the future much. But when they eventually do, the singularity is going to be a huge stumbling block. He knows this. Shit, he says under his breath. He saw us. Dr. Payne approaches them. Hello, Val. Out recharging your batteries? They have a running joke, not very funny, about how Val is looking more and more like a cyborg by the day. Payne might be a bit more sensitive if Val told him about his implants, but Val doesn't see any other reason why he should. He hasn't told Maya about them either. Actually, Val says, I was just taking in some last minute memories of human bodies before they become redundant. Payne chuckles. What a waste that would be, he says, turning his attention to Maya and extending a hand. Dr. Payne, he says, not half as diabolical as I sound, equally at home with Professor Pleasure. Maya makes a face like, who is this cornball? But she shakes the hand anyway, Maya Davis. Major, bio, planning to be a doctor, a pediatrician. Well, then you two will have plenty to discuss, won't you? Here, he hands the couple a flyer. 
What's this? Val asks. I'm organizing a rally against nuclear weapons. We'll have a booth at the sustainability fair. Come on by. Will do, Val says. A pleasure to meet you, Maya, says Payne, taking his leave. Once he's out of earshot, Val snipes, as if some rally in the middle of the Pacific is gonna bring an end to the nuclear age. Maya nods, but with pursed lips. It's cool he's trying though, yeah? Engaging with the real world instead of keeping his head in the clouds? What's that supposed to mean, Val asks. It's just that so many professors, you think my head's in the clouds? He can't believe it. After all he's taught her, she's still a skeptic, still an infidel. She sighs. Val, we're having a decent day so far. Can you maybe just take a couple of deep breaths and let this go before you get all worked up again? She's so smart, she can read the future like this sometimes. He does his best to hold back the avalanche of his thoughts. He takes the deep breaths, swallows what he can of his pride, forces a smile. Gimelin, he says, elvish for I love you. They haven't said it in English yet, but elvish feels more sacred to them anyway. Gimelin, she replies, and she returns the smile too. And then Val is compelled to remind her that the singularity is fundamentally a good thing, that the post-humans of the future will be all around better than the humans of the present. Isn't that exciting? Whatever, she says. Let's go get some coffee. I'm tired. So they go to Paradise Palms, the little cafeteria across from the library, and they drink coffee, which makes Val think about caffeine and its effects on the brain. Then he looks in Maya's eyes and thinks about love and its effects on the brain and wonders if a drug is a drug is a drug. Foom. Their love grows exponentially. The singularity doesn't come, but there's a new iPhone. For some reason, Val can't understand Maya stays with him, and he wants her to, though her very existence continually erodes the core of who he thought he was. With the exception of the rhetoric of video games, A+, his first semester, gra semester grades are mediocre. Embarrassingly enough, he got a B in future studies and a B minus in computer science. In theory, he is deeply interested in the latter. In practice, he is distracted, troubled, confused. Maya keeps inviting him over to her house to meet her family, but he keeps resisting. It feels like some sort of symbolic point of no return. And he's not ready for that. He's not ready for anything anymore. He's not even Larry came to college for. Well, I think I'll leave off there. Thanks for listening. Um Actually, I'm so distracted by Tom's work. I'm not too sure if I can read my stuff, but let me try. So um, I have two poems and um, a short story. So I will read um, both a poems and an excerpt of a short story. So the first one is called um, Wild Pigs at Night. They are bolder this year, venturing forth from their mountain burrows into our valley, hunting for avocados, lily koi, Falling guava, leaving an uneasy bed, flattened heliconia, splintered roots. I have heard foraging in the dark, heavy grunts breaking the quiet, moist, new Anu night. I have felt them below my window, their hard, bristled bodies bruising their way through the tangled vines and ferns, draping the sloping of white. They have caused quite a stir among our neighbors with their manicured lawns, well-trained dogs, precisely set alarms. I will wait for them at night, remove the traps set among the ferns. They will return again when the fruit, when the guava trees are heavy with fruit, waiting to be shaken and plundered. Okay, my second poem is titled, uh, Walk Always. They eat quickly, sticky rice ladled from a worn, dimpled bowl, smeared with condiments, pickled plum, chilies, fermented beans. They sip weak tea from thick mugs lettered with world's greatest grandmother. Hand in hand, they walk always. Booth Road, Laupu, Ho Valley bus stop. Worshipped by her creations, ribbon lays, knitted beer can hats, unka shishu tigers, fish scale patchwork. She reigns in her greenhouse, plucking slugs with chopsticks, 
dropping them carefully into empty kimchi jars. She is the savior of her subjects, dendrobium, kelia, ginger. When we return to pay homage, she weighs us off with a laugh and treats us to pig seat Simon. We ignore the cockroaches roaming freely among the silverware. Okay, and the last thing I'm gonna read is an excerpt from a short story called Najuma. And um, Najuma is the name of a, um, an African ground hornbill, which is a very large black bird with a red throat that escaped from the Honolulu Zoo. This bird encounters two uh, elderly homeless people. They're a couple, Joe and Kai, who um, live in a tent at the foothills of um, Diamond Head. So the excerpt that I'm gonna read is when Joe um, actually reads more about this strange bird um, through um, a newspaper article he found in the garbage can. I had the newspaper article still, took it out of my pocket, carefully unfolded and read it again. The Southern ground hornbill is well known for its association with rain, drought, lightning, and general weather forecasts. It is believed by some that some early morning calls are a sign of rain. The hornbill has also been associated with the ability to alter human perceptions. Through traditional rituals, the bird can be utilized to improve or change a human's ability to alter reality, create illusions, and expand awareness. In certain cultures, it's been found that the southern ground hornbill is associated with death and unluckiness. The Indebeli believe that an elderly person will die if a southern ground hornbill comes near the home. From then on, I threw leftover meat as far away from our tent as possible. I am not superstitious by nature, but that bird had me thinking. I saw the hornbill almost every other day, especially when I threw out food. I had to forage harder to feed the three of us. Kai grew weaker and ate less, while the hornbill seemed to be eating more of her share. Kai hit her pain, but it was easy to see she was getting weaker. Her bones began to stick out and her arms looked so frail as afraid to pick her up. She had a hard time breathing, especially at night. I finally said, Kai, I need to bring you to a doctor. She shook her head and said no as loud as she could. At night, she started to talk in her sleep. She called out names I didn't know. Her body shook in conversations I didn't understand. I wrote down the names in case, well, in case I needed to contact someone. It was Saturday, so I hiked down to the farmer's market. It was late morning and crowded. There were Japanese tourists, locals with armfuls of anthuriums for graves, young families eating scones and musubi. I looked into the trash cans and found half eaten roasted corn and plate lunch with rice omelet. I wandered to the produce stands. One of the vendors recognized me and gave me a bag of bruised papayas. They were soft. Kai would like these. I sat on a curb and scraped the corn kernels from the cob and chewed gingerly. It was sweet and reminded me of another place a place where sweet corn was plentiful in the summer. I watched the families around me and saw an older couple, both white haired, sitting on the curb, sharing a plate of noodles. I got up, looked into the trash cans one more time for meat for the hornbill and started to hike back to Kai. She had a difficult night. Early the next morning, I placed the meat leftovers at the entrance of the tent. I needed him to come close. I went back to the tent and held Kai. I heard him land, his wings brushing the sides of the tent. I heard him pick up the pieces of spam, linger a bit, and then fly away. Kai lay there with her eyes closed but breathing hard. I had hoped for more from the hornbill. Kai died the next morning. I brushed her white hair. It was matted and dirty, but I tried to make it look neat. I took a wet rag and wiped her forehead and cheeks. A sticky liquid dribbled out of her mouth. And when I turned her on her side, a steady stream poured out. So I carried her out of the tent. 
I put her in my sleeping bag and zipped her up. I decided to bury her, but the ground was hard and dry and I was too tired to dig much. The hornbill came by that afternoon looking for food. He hopped close to Kai in the sleeping bag and stood waiting expectant. I sat on the ground next to Kai and closed my eyes. I saw Kai, younger. I was with her, young as well. We were both clean and neat, sharing a plate of noodles. I opened my eyes and the hornbill was still there watching. Najuma, I need rain. He stopped closer, his large beak approaching Kai's body. No, Kai is gone. I need rain. He shook his body and unfolded his broad wings. He flew up into the sky, his white wingtips brushing the kiabi branches. He emitted one long screech. That night it started to drizzle. The end. Thank you so much to Bamboo Ridge for including me in this issue. This is actually my first publication. Um, so just a little about myself. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a ninth grade English teacher at Franken High School. I'm in my third year right now. I was actually a student there as well. So it's kind of um, nice to go back there and it's like I'm in school forever. Um, and part of my job, I, I teach poetry heavily and narratives and trying to empower the student's voice because I had, I've had this saying for a while now that we always try to raise kids to be prepared for the real world, but sometimes we forget that their world is, is real and there's a lot that we can learn from them. So my poem, I have one poem to share. The title is Kumon. As a kid, I, I went to tutoring and this kind of gives you an idea of how I felt about it. My hand flickering under the desk, trying to add 12 and nine, waving like her flashcards, she interrupts. Why do you count with your fingers? Her cracked pink polish reflected the pink of her pencil case, like the pink tint and tilted as a pink match the smirk of her face. Her hair curls like the bows of Christmas presents, always with rewards after passing a level. Distracted by her new sparkly sandals that shone like the countless golden stars name, I hated it there. Every Tuesday at Fern, I thought it wasn't fair. My mom asked, why can't you write nice like her? Why aren't you smart like her? Why can't you be more like her? I ask myself too. My eyes are too brown, mom. They don't sparkle sky blue. My hair is too black, like the stains on my hand-me-down shirt. My skin too tan. Muddied by the shame of my jeans, I thought I wasn't fair. I hated Kumon. I was still on addition while she did the vision. I sat next to her, but I was always behind. Thank you. Anyway, this is my first uh, fiction story. Um, I've written a lot of nonfiction and poetry, um, although a lot of the people that read my nonfiction probably thought it was fiction. Um, so, I'm, as everyone else is, I'm grateful to Bamboo Ridge for. for uh, especially the Enders for accepting the story. Uh, the name of the uh, story is Pianissimo Finale. Pianissimo is music, it's a musical term meaning very softly. Of course, finale means an ending. Uh, it, came, it was inspired by a, an actual concert that my wife and I attended in 2018. I wish I could still go to the concerts, but anyway. So, um, I'm going to start from the beginning of the story, and uh, like uh, Tom's story, I hope this is a good teaser <laughs> to get people to buy the, the issue. <clears throat> oh, I should say, um, the story flips back and forth in time, so when it's, when it's doing that kind of flip, I'm going to pause between sections so that you'll know that it's changing the time perspective. 
Marissa saw the woman still seated after even the orchestra had left the stage. She must have fallen asleep and needed to be roused. Ma'am, you need to wake up and leave so we can clean up, said Marissa, touching her on the shoulder. The woman appeared to be very haggard, but she seemed so much at peace. The expression on her face was one Marissa had only seen before on a painting of the Madonna. The woman remained motionless. Marissa had a terrible thought. Could it be? She would need to get Miss Hasegawa to come over and look. Miss Hasegawa was heading in the direction of the main seating anyway, when she saw Marissa hurrying toward her. Miss Hasegawa, I think we might have a dead woman in row eight. Is she one of our regulars, said Miss Hasegawa. I don't recognize her, but she might be. She's pretty well dressed for a matinee crowd. Following her usher's footsteps, Miss Hasegawa went up to the seat in the middle of the concert hall and felt for a pulse. <clears throat> Elise, time for your piano lesson. This is what Elise heard every Wednesday after school, although her mother knew that her daughter would never miss a lesson because she enjoyed it too much. She would rather practice her piano than go to school, stay with, play with her friends, or even have a chocolate sundae, which was her favorite dessert. Ms. Chung, her piano teacher, was very nice, and she had been teaching her from the very beginning when Elise was only six. She already showed signs of becoming a virtuoso from that age. Ms. Chung soon encouraged her to play some very difficult pieces, such as Chopin etudes and Liszt sonatas. Elise, as Ms. Chung used to like to tell everyone, played with joy and gusto. At the same time, she commented on Elise's weight, suggesting that five fat fingers made for a poor piano playing. Elise did like to eat, but wasn't fat, just pleasantly plump. She ate too many chocolate sundaes. Elise, said her father, Frank, do you know where we got your name? Yes, Daddy, said Elise for the thousandth time, from Beethoven's Bagatelle to Elisa. And who is your favorite composer? Chopin, said Elise, which was her reply, just to teach her father, just to tease her father, because she knew how much he liked Beethoven, especially his symphonies. The family went to the Honolulu Symphony concerts as often as they could afford to go, but never missed any performance of a Beethoven composition. Elise had come to like Ludwig von Beethoven as much as her father did. She imagined herself on the stage, gown flowing, hair flowing, fingers flowing to see how it, one, it would be one day to be the virtuoso pianist for a Beethoven concerto. She could definitely picture herself playing her first piano concerto in C major. What made it even more fun was that they would go to Zippy's after the concert and she would feast on hamburgers and her usual chocolate sundae. Often, she and her father would hum several bars with a piece they just heard and laugh at the renewed faces of the other customers. Frank loved to sing, and he had a decent voice. He said that his voice was his instrument. Since it was part of his original equipment, he frequently joked that it cost him nothing, unlike Lisa's piano, which was a Steinway upright. Once in a while, he would ask Elise to play a popular tune, and he would sing along. Elise loved those moments the best. She would try to sing, but would get embarrassed, and her voice would strangle, and only squeaks would come out. So she gave up singing by the time she was nine, despite encouragement from her father. We could sing to what, Elise? Elise was digging through the trash cans in Admiral Thomas Square, where she spent nights in her tent. It was August 2018, and she had forgotten how long she had been homeless how long she had been hungry. She had forgotten when she had lost her parents or where they were buried. She had forgotten if she had any friends beyond the familiar faces she saw poking out of the tents in the square or along Victoria Street. She had forgotten how long she had had this bad pain in her chest, not that she could ever afford to see a doctor about it. She did not think that she had forgotten how to play the piano or how much she loved its sound or how long it had been since she heard well, truly good music. Digging through the trash, she found a fire for the symphony, the Honolulu Symphony. One of the many reasons she had placed herself in the squalor of Admiral Thomas Square was that it was right across from Blaisdell Concert Hall. Some nights, she would sneak near the entrance to try to hear a few strains of a sonata or a prelude. The security always chased her away. But wait, this fire said something about a concert that only cost $5. How could that be? It was even on her birthday, September 19th. Was this a sign that it was destiny for her? It was some kind of preview for the symphony season. What would they be playing? 
How could she scrape together the money? As it was, the few dollars she was able to beg paid for what little food she could get that wasn't out of a trash bin. In the eighth grade, Elise had won the Honolulu Junior Piano Competition given to the best pianist in the city. In her first years of high school, she was getting ovations at piano recitals and being asked to play at parties. Just like after a concert, her parents would treat her to hamburgers and a chocolate sundae after a good recital. And she had lots of good recitals. It was getting to be shaped like a cello. Still, her fingers could move as well as ever. The music teacher at McKinley was all but certain that she would earn a scholarship at a mainland university or conservatory and become an internationally renowned concert pianist. Around the end of her sophomore year, things changed. She had lost focus on her piano and even stopped eating very much. Concerned when she had lost a lot of weight, her father took her to a psychologist who specialized in adolescent mental health, Dr. Bernadette Kramer. No, she did not have an eating disorder. It was most likely, said Dr. Kramer, that Lisa was suffering from what was a mild bipolar condition. She recommended cognitive behavior therapy, which was her expertise. So she would treat Elise and ask her psychiatrist associate, Dr. Navarro, to prescribe a light antidepressant medication, Hofrenin. Insurance would cover the cost. It was not unusual for Elise to be at the edge of some summer festival they would hold at Thomas Square and she would see little girls walk by enjoying a chocolate sundae. This always threw her into one of her depthless depressions, as it made her think of her father and how he would make her feel so special. What was it that he had told her about her name? If somehow she could get to that symphony presentation, perhaps she would feel as good as she did in those days. So far, this summer had been no different with all the festivals, especially after they renovated Thomas Square. Elise, Elise hoped that this summer would be different. This summer would end with her attending a concert. How much had she saved so far? She rummaged around in her long shopping cart to see if she could find a single dollar or a quarter or two. She found only three nickels and two pennies. Well, she was not beyond doing what some of her friends did, digging trash cans, garbage bags, and even recycle bins to find aluminum cans she could turn for their deposits. The problem was that most of these were the territory of J.M. or Icarus, two of the more ferocious guys who hung around the square. She didn't dare get them mad at her. She could resort to begging for money, something she had done before, but only when she was starving. Who am I kidding, she thought to herself. Even if she could find the money, how could she go in the hall wearing these rags, smelling like she did? The sheer impossibility of her dream brought on that ineffable sadness that no one can describe, only experience. Me. Nee. 